No. So I'm here to talk about kernel TLS and hardware TLS offload in FreeBSD 13. This has been a long time effort. It started initially with Netflix, and now also Mellanox and Chelsea is involved. And uh, my name is, like I said, Hans Peter Selaski, also called HPS, or HSelaski at FreeBSD.org. I started out a long time ago with uh, USB, and now I'm doing full-time networking with Mellanox. And here we have Drew Gallatin, and I started off a long time ago with FreeBSD Alpha and uh, networking and various things, and uh, here we are with TLS. Why don't you go ahead, Hans? Sure. So I have a little petition here. So how many has ever been to a cryptography course before at university? Put your hands up. So yeah, there's a couple of people here. So that's good. So you may be familiar with Bob and Alice. I need to say a little bit about why we do cryptography. So Bob and Alice are the two famous characters that try to exchange a secret message. And there's also the evil guy that tried to eavesdrop and do data tampering. So quickly summarized, cryptography is making a numerical message depending on a small pre-shared key. And uh, you can use it right or you can use it wrong. And uh, usually it's good. It, it prevents leaking data to others and, and also you can use it for checksumming. And uh, unfortunately also cryptography can make your data disappear faster when you lose your keys. So be careful. TLS, that's maybe familiar to a lot of you guys. It's, it's short for Transport Layer Security. I'm trying to be very easy starting in the morning. It's used behind HTTPS on port 443. And uh, it, it can support multiple crypto codecs like AES. We're mostly going to focus on AES because that's the main standard with TLS 1.3. And uh, it can also support different key exchange protocols. So we, you maybe know about Diffie-Hellman and RSA, and uh, there might be more that we don't know about yet. So like mentioned, TLS is a protocol, and uh, it runs on top of TCP. And then on top of TLS, you can run other protocols, like shown in the slide. And uh, this is just to give you a picture. And I'm going to dig a little bit into details. When I started doing TLS work, uh, this was a black box. What is TLS? And trying to find documentation was not so easy, so I started with the code. TLS has a small header that encapsulates the data. Uh, we have uh, 13 bytes, uh, typically, but it's variable. So in the beginning, we have a type. Uh, it can be data, handshake, alert. For example, alert happens when someone is tampering with the data and the receiver identifies, oh, I cannot decrypt this packet, and it sends an alert message to terminate the connection. Then you have some major and minor numbers. And, and for TLS 1.2, it's 3 and 3. This actually dates back to the times of SSL version 3. So, so it's not actually should be 1 and 2, but it's 3 and 3. And uh, the TLS length is a 16-bit number, so you can actually encapsulate up to 64 kilobytes minus 1, to be exact. But a lot of applications limit this to 16 kilobytes. And, and uh, yeah, that's just a kind of legacy thing. You need to know that when you use TLS, you might need to use smaller blocks. You cannot do so big blocks. Uh, after the length, you have uh, some variable nonce. It's usually eight bytes with uh, some uh, uh, crypto codecs, depending on the algorithm. And, Sometimes it's not present. Uh, and then you have the data. Uh, 
So this is TLS 1.2. So the difference for TLS 1.3 is basically that you don't have a nonce. The, the nonce is kept on the tr side track of the protocol. It's maintained by the uh, hardware or software and, and, and to, to save bandwidth. And uh, as you can see here, the, the major number and minor numbers are still three and three. So why is that? That's again, we have a lot of routers and equipment that only support TLS 1.2. And if you try to change these numbers, then maybe that equipment won't support this protocol and your packets will be dropped. So in, instead of putting the, the first byte, the TLS type in the beginning, we now put it after the TLS data. That's not shown in the picture. And uh, yeah, th this is just a curiosity at the moment. I'm going to say a few words about AES. Uh, AES is an uh, old algorithm, relatively old. started in the Netherlands, and it wasn't called AES. You can read about it at Wikipedia. It's basically doing 16 and 16 bytes at a time. And uh, it can be used as a stream version. That means you can stop encrypting and keeping the state, and you can resume encrypting. So basically, you can... Uh, when you're encrypting a stream, you can do byte by byte because it used the previous block, output from the previous block to encrypt the next block. And th in the beginning, there is an uh, initial vector that you use to start with. Uh, and I can also mention FreeBSD supports the non-stream version of AES2. The transport layer security is in FreeBSD implemented by OpenSSL. I know there are other alternatives like LibreSSL, Libre but I'm going to focus on what we have in FreeBSD at the moment. Uh, you may be familiar with the term AESNI, that's AES New Instruction Set. It's uh, usually a CPU offload for AES and it makes it run faster. Then, then we have also a software kernel TLS. That means instead of doing this encryption in the user space, we do it in the kernel instead, and I will return to why we do that later on in the presentation. There's also something called Open Crypto Framework, or OCF, uh, that is basically uh, a PCI card that where you can uh, DMA the data and get the encrypted data back. And, and that's for the kernel. And then we have yet another technology. It's called TCP Offload Engine, or TOEI. That means we send only the TCP data to the network card, and then the network card will do both the TCP and the TLS in the same operation. And then we have NIC kernel TLS. That is when we're sending full TCP frames with data to the NIC, and the NIC will then decipher the header and undo the TLS encryption packet by packet. And this way you can also do TSO. So, so you can put down a big chunk of data to the NIC the NIC will do both the fragmenting of the frames and it will do uh, encryption at the same time. So I'm going to look a little bit in OpenSSL. Uh, OpenSSL is, you can look at it like a filter. It's based around uh, something called a BO structure. Um, it's like a source and sync for data and you, you can uh, hook them together to, to, to make a chain of filters, like it can read from a file, it can do encryption, and it can output to a socket. And uh, with this framework, all data must have a pointer in user space. So, so it's passing around pointers. It's zero copy inside OpenSSL, but when you do a socket to send, then it will be a copy into the kernel. So I, I will talk more about this later on as well. Uh, 
open SSL and kernel TLS. So uh, we have a guy at my office in, not in Norway, but in Israel, that's called Boris. He made 16 patches to support something called kernel TLS. It's like uh, offload for doing the encryption in the kernel instead of in user space. And uh, he did it initially for Linux. And uh, now we also have this in FreeBSD. So the API is uh, very simple. It's two set socket options. You have a set, so set socket option that turns on TLS for TX. And you have a set socket option where you can switch the backend you are using in the kernel. So, so you can, for example, say, I want to use the NIC offload. I want to use Open Crypto Framework. I want to use something else. So, so you, you, you can switch around which backend you're using. And uh, I have a link here which shows when FreeBSD support was added. It's revision 3.5.1.5.2.2. And this is a cumulative work of many people. So John Baldwin sitting here on the front did uh, push button work and uh, get it, got it into the tree. But, but it's really, uh, like Drew here will mention in his part, it, it's, it's a lot of people involved. Okay, as Hans was saying, um, a lot of people were involved in this. Uh, back in 2014, 2015, Netflix made a commitment to uh, protect the privacy of its users and to start encrypting the, via, t via TLS the streams that uh, we send the movies to your to your devices in. Um, and so the problem was, this is really expensive. How are we gonna do this? And uh, Scott Long and uh, Randall Stewart did, uh, Scott Long had the idea, Randall Stewart did the initial implementation of kernel TLS. And the idea was to preserve our uh, normal send file pipeline where, you know, instead of what, what, what a lot of people do, which is to read the data in, you know, from the kernel into a web server and then, and then write the data from the web server back into the kernel, we kind of want to avoid that extra step, and we just want to be able to do a send file. So by doing uh, TLS in the kernel, we can preserve that same uh, pipeline, and we can still use a async send file, and everything looks basically the same except for the crypto step. Uh, and the idea was that we want to do it as, you know, as, mo as efficiently as possible, and a huge amount of time was spent uh, by Randall uh, making it uh, efficient, and then even more time was spent by me coming along after Randall and e making it even more, more efficient. <laughs> So in order to do some of these things uh, in, for TLS, we needed some enhancements to, to MBUPS. And I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the not ready flag, I'm gonna talk about the, and I'm gonna talk about unmapped MBUPS. And then Hans is gonna continue on with uh, syntax for NIC TLS. So what's the not ready flag? Uh, this is something that uh, Gleb Smirnoff, uh, also from Netflix, came up with to support async send file. And the idea is that, um, when you are doing send file, you're reading stuff from disk. And when you, whenever you read stuff from disk, there's a chance you're gonna block. So rather than having Nginx have to block and lose an Nginx context and have to have a thread pool, the idea is that Nginx um, uses async send file. So what happens is you uh, send file submits the, uh, the, the mbuff into the socket buffer and it issues a disk read to, to fill the pages that are attached to the MBUF. Um, but when it puts the MBUF in the socket buffer, it marks it not ready. And what that means is when TCP is pro processing the socket buffer, looking for things to send, it has to stop when it runs into a not ready. So when the disk interrupt handler comes uh, and the pages are now there, it marks the MBUFs ready and calls the TCP uh, ready routine, which, which then calls TCP to re-examine the socket buffer and send anything which has been marked ready. And in that way, you can avoid having an Nginx thread pool uh, where you're having lots of context blocking. The, um, the handy thing is that I realized uh, that it allows for a very simple way to sort of add a stage to that pipeline. And after the, the uh, pages come in from disk, you can leave them not ready and call a uh, crypto routine, which will then mark them not ready. So that, in that way, we can use the not ready flag for kernel TLS as well. And so um, the next thing I want to talk about is unmapped NBUFs. 
And what that really means is a, uh, an MBUF that's basically pointing to an array of uh, physical, uh, first it started off as physical pages, and in fact the structure is still kind of named that way, but it's really just physical addresses. Um, so it was initially, and I initially thought of it for SendFile uh, and not for TLS, and the idea was that in SendFile you have one MBUF pointing to one page, so for, you know, 64K, you've, you've got 64K divided by, by 4K, or like 16, 16 pages. You, so basically for, for every 4K, you're in, in a socket buffer, you're walking a new MBUF, you're taking a new cache miss, and TCP walks those socket buffer chains a lot, especially, you know, for processing acts and doing things like that. If you can combine all of these, re all of these into an array, so you, instead of having just Instead of just having 4K reference, you can have 16K in the case in the case of TLS, or you know, like 100K in the case of uh, of, of non-TLS. You can reduce these cache misses <coughs> by a large factor. And uh, even in our unencrypted workloads, uh, at the time when I introduced this, it reduced our CPU by something like between five and 20 percent, depending on the on the on the machine. So the other handy thing, which I realized later, is that it also provides a nice way to to, to work uh, with TLS. So by enhancing this just a little bit, by adding space to the front for the, uh, the 13 bytes that Hans was talking about for the beginning of the TLS record, and adding some space at the back for the end of the TLS record, all of a sudden you've got um, a single atomic way to refer to a TLS record. And that's really handy for being able to do uh, reference counting for TCP retransmits for uh, NIC TLS. And the reason that's important is because TLS records don't always end up lining up with um, TCP segment sizes. So what can happen is TCP uh, can get an ACK for, uh, you know, up to a certain point in the stream, whereas th that might be in the middle of the TLS record. So what TCP wants to do is TCP says, hey, I'm done with everything. Up to this point, go ahead and free it. Well, the, the, the problem could be that if, um, if we need to retransmit then the very next piece, you know, the, the, the last part of the TLS record, in order, to for, in order for the NIC to be able to retransmit that, it's got to see the front part. So if we didn't have these MBUFs, we'd have to have, we'd have to have come up with some more expensive reference counting way to prevent the front of the TLS record being freed so that the NIC could again DMA it down and, uh, and, and recalculate the checksum for the first part of the TLS record. So, with all that said, um, the first, uh, ba basically with, for our software TLS implementation, uh, we pass the data uh, from, from user space into the kernel or from send file into, you know, in, into the kernel. And the kernel does the TLS framing I in the kernel. Um, and like, like I was in hinting at before, um, the MBUFs are marked not ready while they're waiting to be encrypted. And the, um, Basically, the MBUFs are, are queued onto, into basically a, a, per, a per CPU uh, TLS, kernel TLS worker thread. And once that, once that worker thread encrypts the data, it marks it ready, and <coughs> it's, it's ready to go uh, to TCP. So, over to you, Hans. Yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something called MBUF sand tags. And uh, th this is basically a pointer. So when you're doing NIC TLS offload, uh, you're allocating a resource on the NIC to hold the crypto key and the crypto cursor. And uh, the sand tag is kind of owned by the NIC. And uh, it allows the network interface to decide if the packet coming in needs a special processing or not. And uh, the reason we put this SANTAG in the AMBUF is uh, that it needs to be very fast. We, we, we cannot do a lookup in a hash table, uh, mess around with uh, five tuples down in the NIC driver. It needs to be fast. So, and also, we need to be able to traverse <laughs> technologies like VLAN and LAG. That's short for link aggregation. 
And uh, you can imagine when a packet goes out that it might not always go out on the same NIC. Uh, if you reconfigure your lag, for example, the packet can suddenly change to another interface. And it's very unfortunate if uh, suddenly your unencrypted traffic goes straight on the wire. So we added mechanisms that will detect route changes in both VLAN and log. And it will also check if the underlying network device supports a NIC uh, TLS offload to prevent unencrypted data going on the wire. The API for sand tags is very simple. We, we basically have four methods, and, and these are function pointers in the network or struct IFNet in FreeBSD. Uh, you can allocate a sand tag. You can uh, modify it. You can query it. You can free it. Uh, the allocate function is recursive. So you basically ask your route interface I want to have a sand tag for TLS. Then it checks the capabilities of the network interface. Do I have TLS support or not? If I don't have TLS support, we return a failure. Uh, and this is recursive, so, so if you have a VLAN on top, it has the VLAN first. And for log, it's so that log use something called a hash of the five tuple. It's usually called a flow ID. And this information is not always present at the beginning of the connection. So, so sometimes before you can allocate a crypto tag, you need to wait for uh, a few packets to be exchanged so that the socket can record which is my hash and which is my then uh, output network inter interface under lag. Uh, and, and so again, which is my destination uh, output ring in the network interface. This is usually called uh, a toplet hash. And, and we use the seven least significant bits to, to switch the packets on the TX rings. Maybe a lot of you are familiar with that. Uh, from the network uh, stack perspective, uh, things are very simple. Uh, you, you basically set the sand tag pointer, which is the sand tag in the packet header of the AMBUF. And then you also need to set a checksum flag for the sand tag because uh, we try to avoid increasing the size of the AMBUF so it would use another cache line. Uh, and. Uh, Unfortunately, we had to share the sand tag with the receive interface pointer. And, and to avoid uh, leaking receive interface into sand tags, for example, when you do a ping, you might get back the receive interface pointer. So it's in the union. Uh, this is maybe too much details for you, but we, we have a flag we abuse, a checksum flag, to indicate if you have a sand tag or not. Uh, from the network driver perspective, it, it basically does the opposite. It checks if the checksum flag is set, and uh, it does a container of the sand tag you specified in the AMBUF. And uh, this usually gets you the per network interface specific uh, structure that contains, for example, the destination send queue, or a copy of the so-called flow ID. And it can do a simple check. Is this packet still valid for this interface or not? Uh, and this is in the fast path. So here you can see uh, a set of uh, uh, different use cases for data flow. So the, the, the good old case is that you're using a socket write that is all to the left with OpenSSL. You have an unencrypted buffer inside OpenSSL. Uh, you do the encryption in user space. You copy the encrypted buffer into the kernel 
and then again the NIC will read from the kernel buffer and put it on the wire. Uh, in the second case where you have software kernel TLS, you have the unencrypted buffer in user space, you write it into the kernel via a system call, and uh, the kernel will then encrypt it. Like Drew said earlier, we have a per CPU thread that will read uh, unencrypted data with M not ready from the socket buffer, and it will encrypt it and put the ready flag, and then the encrypted buffer will go on uh, onto the NIC, and the NIC will put it on the wire. And then with NIC kernel TLS, you, you, as you can see, you have an unencrypted buffer in user space. You write it uh, into the socket buffer, and uh, after it goes into the socket buffer, we write it straight to the NIC. And uh, I can also mention that there is some magic here going on. So, so when you do a system call write uh, to the socket buffer, for every system call you do, you will add a no, TLS header and trailer. So, so it will kind of wrap your transmitted data with, automatically with a TLS uh, header and trailer. So, so it's all seamless to user space. You just write the unencrypted data and uh, it's, it's automatically encapsulated. And then after the data is in the kernel with this additional uh, header and trailer, then it will go to the NIC and the NIC will do the encryption. So uh, this, this eye chart here basically shows the, the data flow uh, for send file. And um, I'm in particular, I'm showing the data flow for send file with uh, software kernel TLS. And one thing you'll notice is that for basically every 100 gigabits is, you know, divide by eight for gigabytes, it's 12 and a half gigabytes a second. So when you're doing, um, when you're doing send file with software kernel TLS, basically the data flow is you bring things in from the, you bring things in from the disks into memory, and then the CPU has to read everything you just brought into the disk to do the crypto. And then once it does the crypto, it's got to write it back out into the memory. And then from the memory, it's got to write it, or really DMA read it into the NIC. So basically you multiply your, your band, if you want to do 100 gigabits, you've got to have 400 gigabits of memory bandwidth or, or 60 gigabytes a second, which is basically just about as much as, uh, as a, a Broadwell Xeon can do. Uh, the nice thing about NIC TLS is all of a sudden, see these green arrows that go up and down? Now you don't see them anymore because all of a sudden you, you, you don't have to do this, 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 this memory read and memory write anymore and your memory bandwidth requirements are cut almost in half. And this is important because uh, certain uh, CPU vendors like to segment their product lines by memory channels and uh, memory speeds. And so you can, you can, you can maybe go down a product line uh, if you can do NIC TLS. Next slide. So here you can kind of see what you would expect if you did TCP dump with a modified iperf that support TLS offload in the kernel. So if you do TCP dump on the iperf client sending the data, you will see here the unencrypted data with TCP dump. You see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. On the server side, you will see the encrypted data. So this is exactly the same packet. So this is on the client side, and this is on the server side. And this is just to show you that this is what you can expect from uh, NIC TLS uh, and also software TLS offload. So uh, we hit some issues when trying to implement NIC kernel TLS. Uh, As I said already, the NIC is messing with the TCP data, uh, but it already does so with TSO. So for those familiar with the term TSO, large send offload, uh, the NIC already updated the sequence number when it fragments big chunks of data, and now it's also uh, 
encrypting TCP data as you go along. So, so, but who says we have to follow the OSC model for everything? Uh, retransmission of TLS packets. As Drew said, there is a need for resending the beginning of a TLS record if you're doing a retransmit in the middle of a TCP packet. Uh, and this actually cross a uh, TLS record. Uh, as you might remember, I said in the beginning of the talk that we have a 16K maximum length of TLS records. And that basically means that if you need to retransmit one byte at the end of a TLS record, you need to kind of dump uh, almost 16K down to the NIC before you can retransmit that last byte in order to get the right crypto state. So, so but for the good case, you don't do this. So, so you might want to consider uh, uh, using something like rack or, uh, yeah, try to get the trans retransmission rate as low as possible when using TLS to ma minimize the PCI bandwidth used. Uh, then we have some benchmarks. So, so let's see what's first. Yeah, right. Drew. So this is this is in the benchmark section, but it's not actually a benchmark. This is uh, data from a uh, Netflix uh, circa 2016 100 gig. Uh, server. It's basically a Broadwell-based Xeon with 16 cores, 32 threads, uh, four uh, really fat, uh, fast NVMe drives, and one uh, Chelsea OT6 NIC. And the case on the left is without kernel TLS. And the blue bars are, uh, serve ba are, are the, the bandwidth we're serving out of the NIC. So as you can see, we're maxing out uh, around uh, 40 gigabits a second, and the CPU is, is it's an average of 75 because it kind of zooms between 100 and, and 50. Um, it's it's a case where it's memory it's basically memory uh, memory bandwidth bound and it's uh, miserable for clients because it speeds up and slows down and speeds up and slows down and never really never really finds a sweet spot. Uh, the, it's just easier to say 75 and stop there, but you know I ramble. Um, the second case is the case that uh, Netflix runs today. Uh, basically, we're at we serve at 90 uh, gigabits a second. That's our that's our target bandwidth for 100 for 100 gigabit uh, cache to to allow for uh, a little bit of extra capacity on the link for other things, and we're at about uh, a little less than a little less than 70 percent CPU with software TLS, and the uh, rightmost is with uh, NIC TLS, and as you can see, the uh, the CPU is cut almost in half for the for the same bandwidth. And again, this is NIC TLS on a uh, Chelsea OT6. That's not available uh, right now in head. It's something that uh, John Baldwin has patches for in GitHub, and you can talk to him after the, uh, after the presentation if you want more information on that. So thank you, Hans. So here we have some benchmarks uh, with uh, Mellanox NIC TLS. So the the orange uh, line show here uh, software kernel TLS. So that's basically using uh, the AES, AES uh, instructions in the kernel to do encryption of the packet it's going on the wire. And as you can see, as you go up by number of threads, so uh, you usually start uh, congesting the CPU, because doing software encryption is relatively heavy, uh, even if it's done in the kernel. And the blue line on the bottom is what you would get with plain text. So the CPU usage rises uh, linearly, because on this machine, you have like 28 uh, uh, cores available. And uh, you see here, that as you go up to 28, it's almost linear, and then it rises a little bit. And uh, the gray line is showing NIC TLS with uh, not yet on the market Mellanox 
ConnectX 6 DX. And uh, you can see it used a little bit more CPU, and that's likely because it's uh, encapsulating it with smaller TLS records. So it needs to encapsulate every 16 um, kilobytes, while if you use plain text, you can do 64 kilobytes at a time uh, uh, with regular TSO. And uh, so, so and, uh, and this is also interesting for those of you that do virtualization, that you can imagine you can have a virtualized environment where you don't have to do encryption in software or at the CPU at all. You can have a, or a weak ARM processor can maybe also be a target for such applications. So, so you only need to switch the packets around and, and, and then the NIC will do everything for you. Or, or, or almost everything, except the TCP stack. We, we still want to do TCP stack uh, in the kernel. And uh, as I already mentioned, Mellanox has a web page you can go to. Uh, theoretically, we can support up to 16 million simultaneous TLS records or TLS streams at the same time, either 25 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig, and now also there will be 200 gigabit second. Yeah, the, the, there's various configurations you can use this. It's, uh, you can use 200 gig ports or you can have one 200 gig port. So the, 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 there's different ways you can get 200 gig. And uh, yeah, you, you maybe don't want to say how you get 200 gig over at Netflix. Well, I'll talk about that in the next hour. Yeah. So uh, then we have uh, a little bit about Chelsea's hardware TLS offload. Do you want to say a few words, to John Baldwin? Or yeah, I can. so basically, the the T6 T6 NIC supports uh, TLS 1.1 .1 and 1.2. And, the, and the, the fairly unique thing is it can do both CBC and GCM. Um, we have. Uh, John has the toe support for the, <coughs> sorry, kernel TLS support for, for the toe mode of Chelsea uh, in progress. That's not something we use at Netflix, but it's interesting to a lot of people. And the really interesting thing is that the Open Crypto Framework CCR uh, Chelsea driver is already uh, usable in, in the tree, and you can use it you know, basically right now with what's in the tree. Uh, for, for it's actually one of the only, uh, it's basically the only thing we're talking about now for hardware offload that you could actually like, you know, use like at this, uh, at this second if you're running head. So. so we reached the end of our talk and uh, I would like to know, are there any questions? Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, if there are any questions, please line up here at the microphone. Can you hear it? Is it working? Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the slide with the uh, un uh, the uh, unallocated ones? Oops. Unmapped, I'm lost. So, so just because, uh, uh, just understanding problem. Uh, instead of a chain with a pointers, you are using just an array to point everywhere to, 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 to reduce. You're using an array to point to uh, some number of, of pages. Okay, okay, so, so that's, isn't it generally good advice to avoid that kind of queues with pointers yes. and put arrays yes. in the modern yes, it's something environment. That, it's something that Linux does with their with their SKB pages. Mm -hmm. or I, th I think that's what they call it. It's something that I, wa I wanted to do in FreeBSD for years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Morning. You mentioned virtualized environments. How will the NIC crypto offload be available to running inside the hypervisor virtual machine? Well, th that's really a good question. I will just repeat. So in virtualized environments with uh, Mellanox NICs, uh, they, they provide virtualization inside the NIC. So, so the NIC has multiple virtual PCI functions, and, and you can give this virtual PCI functions to your um, virtualized instance. And, 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 and this way, uh, you, you kind of have all the DMA rings inside your virtual machine. Uh, 
and, and, and the NIC will actually read from this rings directly. So, so th this is one, uh, you know, un unlike Intel adapters, uh, th they don't support this so well. So with, but with Mellanox cars, you can really do it large scale. So that that uh, you can spit up uh, one network card, physical network card, into many smaller virtual PCI functions, and you can just hand them out to your uh, virtual machines. Was that answer for your question? Thank you. Any more questions? Um, um, my question would be, how much flexibility do you uh, lose uh, with that um, in, in regards to things like new TLS versions? Because I mean, new TLS versions come out, you might want to use them, it's, it's and it, it, it gets a bit more complicated, so, so more stuff is involved. Right. So it's, it's pretty rare. What's, what's, in, what's in head right now is TLS up to 1.2. Um, I actually have a patch for TLS 1.3 that's that's working and has served uh, real Netflix customer traffic. So, and, uh, th and they've also run TLS 1.3 with NIC TLS. So, it, I, and I think a new TLS version, at this point, things are becoming ossified. You can tell how ossified they're becoming because 1.3's got a masquerade as 1.2. So I think that the, I think that's gonna slow down a little bit. It's just my personal opinion, I mean, I don't know. But you, 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 do, you do lose flexibility, um, and that's definitely true, but from our, at least from a Netflix perspective, except for people watching on a, on a web client, uh, we mostly, most of the clients are upgraded at a fairly slow, at a fairly slow pace. I mean, one of our problems is, is I'm still supporting TLS 1.0 because of grandma's smart TV she bought in 2010 or whatever, right? So. Okay, uh, final question. Yes, Thank you very much. you're welcome. Congrats again. Nice talk. Thank you.